So I don't know about your house, but my house has been pretty messy this week. Got a lot of little churning going on down there. Usually hurricane season's over with by yes. now, but uh, yep. don't look like it's going to get over with anytime soon. And uh, so let's get more rain this weekend. But you know, I needed a little rain. My onions were starting to struggle a little bit, and I needed a little rain. We don't need a lot, but we need a little bit. I need a little bit, but I was watching some videos on Weather Channel. They told me about some place in Florida getting 20 uh, inches that's again. a little more than what I need. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, about I, 18 inches more than what I need. <laughs> my, uh, I, I'm really worried. I, I'm worried that this one spot I got my sweet corn planted is just absolutely jinxed. Now, I plant. I haven't planted sweet corn in there in three years. It's the smallest plot I got, but it's a great little size for a fall. Cause I done put up plenty of corn. I just want some fresh to eat, give away. Mm -hmm. And last time I planted corn there about three years ago, I don't remember which one. I think it was Irma come through right when they got ready. Now, if, if it's before your ears form, before you get ears on there. If you're about halfway along and it blows over, a lot of time it will stand back up. But yeah. if it's got heavy, almost mature ears on it, mm -hmm. ball game. And yeah. um, so I'm just hoping because I got silks being pollinated right now. Not big ears, but uh, if they were to get blowed hard, I wouldn't have any corn. So I'm, I'm hoping we don't get too much wind. I think it can handle some rain. Um, I got it healed up as good as I can heal it. But we're just gonna have to see. Yep. As far as the other stuff goes, that's I got gardening. That's, that's gardening. gardening. I got all my onions in. I got my elephant garlic in. You got your elephant garlic planted? Yeah, I got my elephant garlic planted. Boy, my onions, I got the fertilizer poured to them and they looking good. Now folks, I'm gonna tell y'all something. One common thing we see out there is people don't shoot the fertilizer to them quick enough. Especially not early enough. Man, as soon as I, I planted them, I got me some fertilizer on them and they looking great. Yeah, I got some so already about wide as a dime yep. at, at the base there yeah um i got all eight of my varieties planted just doing single rows this year not not trying to grow enough to feed all cockle county yep um i still got to get some leeks in in my alley and plot and we'll have videos coming later this week finishing those onions getting that elephant garlic in the ground well, else won't be long. Man, I've been jealous. All these people on the road by road group on Facebook been eating collards and cornbread. Man, these been some of the prettiest cabbage on there. I believe I've ever seen cabbage. Them. Folks eating yep. collards and cornbread. Yep. And uh, now I ain't far. I got collard leaves about that big. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm, and I will pick them small that first go around. So I ain't yep. too far off. Yeah, I've ha I've got a major issue in my garden that I'm not going to address today. But next week I'm going to address it. I am in the process of taking care of it, but. Uh, Old Roger over there on the Georgia coast, I seen a picture of the uh, garden he posted the other day, and he had the same problem I got. I seen his fix, and I'm fixing to do the same thing. A rabbit problem? I got a little bit of a problem, and it has it's been detrimental to my fall garden. Mm. They, uh, I have already eliminated one of them. And, uh, my problem is I can't stay. I, I try to come up there at night time before I go to bed, but I can't make myself get up in the middle of the night and walk up there and walk around in my garden. And I got a feeling that's when it's happening in the middle of the night. They they won't mess with me all to the spring and the summer, but as soon as I go put some collards or some Brussels sprouts in, I'll see them out there. Now I had I lost I have one Brussels sprout plant get chomped on pretty good. Hadn't had any major damage, but I go out there about 9 o'clock. It gets dark pretty early now at 6. So I go out there about 8 o'clock. A lot of times when I go out there and turn my water off. I'll go out there and turn my water off. I keep my 12 gauge right there and um, keep me a headlamp. And I've already texted all my neighbors. I said, you hear shotgun in the middle of the night. Uh, don't worry, it's just Mr. Cottontail meeting his demise. Well, I will tell you this. I lost my entire fall planting of brassicas oh whew. i have had close to that happen before that will hurt your feelings yep but you got to be diligent about you every time you wake oh, up i'm fixing to be diligent every this time. within the next few days we've got some diligence going on every time I'm you wake the, up in the middle of the night to have tt or something you got to walk yeah, out i'm gonna there. have the problem solved in seven days i've already bought the stuff i got it up there and we're fixing to get a problem solved oh you 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 i'm fixing to go big time Okay, well, I can't wait to hear about this. Yep. I'm sorry to hear that about your brassicas. I'm talking about the entire. I had planted them, had them on drip. I had done fertilized them. I had done sprayed them. They were pretty. And within two nights' time, completely 
No. They was uh they was sitting out there watching you playing them, I guarantee you. Mm. That stinks. But that's okay, because you live and learn. Well, I got plenty of call. Um, it won't I, happen again, I can promise you that. <laughs> I got plenty of collards and um and kale I can share with you until you get back on I'm your just feet. glad they don't eat onions. No, my onions are looking good. Yeah. And mustard and turnips, they don't like mustard and turnips. My turnips are looking good. Yeah. They won't eat mustard and turnips. They will eat carrot tops. I they can will eat carrot tops and they love them some broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage collards. and collards. Whew. Man. Eat them to the ground. And sunflowers. You know, I lost a plant of sunflowers out earlier to you. Same spot. Really? Yep. They'd eat sunflowers up. Oh. Uh, yep. Well, better luck next time. No, there ain't going to be no luck. It's going to be for sure next for time. For sure. For sure. Okay. Well, I'll have to share with you. Um, we got a lot of new stuff being added to the website. As boy, I, oh boy, do we ever. So last week I talked about, I, was, I, I changed the the thumbnail on the website under our season now, so it's new for 2021. And you can check there every day. You'll see new stuff being added. And um, every show, when we've added new stuff, I like to kind of go over uh, some of these varieties. And I got some new tomatoes, some new peppers, and some new corn I want to talk about here. So bear with me a minute. Now, some of these tomato varieties you may have heard of before. Some of them you may not have heard of before. And all of these that I'm going to talk about are considered indeterminate varieties. We'll talk about one that's maybe on the fence. <clears throat> but I've noticed we, we had a good bit... Uh, when I was kind of evaluating what varieties to add, we had a good bit of determinants. We didn't have a lot of indeterminants. And in talking to people and listening to our uh, viewers, commenters, most people out there are growing indeterminants and like to grow indeterminants. Now, we're in our little disease-ridden bubble down here where we grow determinants and we like to can them, so we like our production window to be all at one time. But the vast majority of the country can grow determinants all warm season yep. and they like to do that have that long long production i looked up on the uh, internet earlier today just to see what a lot of the companies and <clears throat> information out there talks about indeterminate and determinate tomatoes a lot of the definition on determinate tomatoes says that they make one crop and you know that's a little bit misleading they actually make three different crops if you look at it real close they make a bottom crop uh, a medium crop and then a top crop and they normally about a week apart, something like that, about three weeks your crop is gone. I guess that's what they're getting to, is this gone pretty quick, and it is. You I mean, you got a short season. They all do not come ready at one time, like some of the information out there leads to. No, with the determined. And you can, I mean, string along, your bottom's going to be there first, then you move it in the middle, and then your top is the last. And if you got your good size row of them, you're going to do about three or four canning runs. It ain't yeah. like you're going to can them at one time. Now, these indeterminates can last a long, long, long time. As long as you don't get yeah. super, super, super hot or you live yeah. in a real disease uh, area. Let me go over these these boys first here. Did you get me all the ones I needed? I thought I did. Okay. So, I know old James George is going to be happy about this because he swears this is the best tomato. And they grow a ton of them down there. And this one here is called Better Boy. You might have heard of this one. Uh... The, the seeds can be a little hard to find online. You find these as plants a lot of times at your big box stores. But uh, this one's won a lot of awards over the years, and it's probably one of the most popular indeterminate varieties out there. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dip my toe with some of them this year. Um, so this is a hybrid. I believe it's nematode resistant. Um, so you got some disease resistance there mm -hmm. uh, that should be able to help you, even if you live in a, a tough tomato growing area, should be able to help you to extend the harvest a little more. And what's great about these varieties we're showing you now, you're not giving up anything for that disease resistance. You still got great flavor. All these are highly regarded as far as the way they taste. And the flavor. I know James and them, they use this one as a canning tomato, make mm -hmm. sauces with it. So it's be a real good one. Now, the boy, the better boy's got some cousins. Yeah, he does. And um, we got two of them here. We got his yellow cousin and his purple cousin. So we got one called Lemon Boy, which is the yellow slash gold version. Now, we have some tomatoes on our site 
the Chef's Choice Orange comes to mind and the Jubilee comes to mind. And the tomatoes are actually, it's hard to tell with these pictures because depending on the printer and stuff, it, the color can change a little bit. But this one is actually bright yellow. It's not gold like some of your other tomatoes, maybe like a yellow pear. This one is bright yellow. This one's got some disease resistance to it. And it's supposed to be the most productive yellow slash gold tomato mm -hmm. variety mm -hmm. out there. Then we got Purple Boy here. And Purple Boy, if you like to grow Cherokee purple tomatoes, mm -hmm. but you struggle with their ability to, to hang on in, in high moisture, humid situations, and we certainly do with that. Oh, I, absolutely. I can grow a Cherokee purple plant, but I may only get three or four tomatoes yeah. off of it. Yep. This Purple Boy is going to be your best bet here. And I believe it's nematode resistant as well. I, have I to, think it is. Uh, it's got a really good disease package. It's indeterminate, just like the Better Boy. But this is going to give you the flavor of a Cherokee purple, but with a more uniform, round, sliceable tomato. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's actually classified as a semi-determinant. Yeah. And I was going to get into that a little bit because I didn't know exactly what that was. Yeah. But I looked that up like it's not confusing enough to some of us because we're indeterminate and indeterminate. And now we got a semi-determinant. And that was actually classified as that. And that would make it a great tomato for container gardening. Right. So uh, as far as I understand the semi-determinant thing, what that means is the plant size looks more like a determinant, but the production window is indeterminate. Mm-hmm. Yep. A few more here, and these are these are other ones here that are popular. You probably heard of before. Maybe they're your favorites. You like to grow, and we got them in here with just outstanding germ rates, 95, 96, 98. So we got the celebrity, which is an AAS winner. That's a real popular one. A lot of people like to grow that one. And it is a shorter day variety to some of the rest of them. Just to give you an example, that purple boy is 80 day, which is a little, little bit longer, and that one right there is 70 day. So it's a little shorter season tomato there. For, to get maturity and some of the rest of them. Seven days is one of the shortest ones I've seen. Right, you can get quick maters there. We got the pink girl, which makes a nice pink tomato, whereas the other ones are, are kind of red. This has got a nice coloration on it. And then we got this one here, this big beef. And these are supposed to make some big old one pound Colossians cover tomato. up yep. a whole loaf of bread. You yep. could make a mater sandwich with one slice if you wanted to there. Mm -hmm. um, so we got those in. Those are our tomatoes. Now let's go to, let's take a break on the nightshade for a second. Let's talk about this corn right here. Yeah, let me have them just for a minute before you get started. Let me, uh, let me tell people a little bit something. As y'all all know, we, we like to grow corn. We have a huge obsession with corn here at Hall Stools. We think it's wonderful to grow. We think everybody should grow it in the garden. If you've never tasted fresh corn out of your garden, you, if you have, you will know you got to have a devotion to grow up because it's not the easiest plant out there to grow. And uh, you have to kind of work with it a little bit. It takes a little bit more care and skill set to grow corn. But once you do, you'll understand you got a passion for how it tastes and for growing it every year and putting it up. That's pretty good. That's good. Did you practice that? I did practice that. <clears throat> so, three new varieties of sweet corn on the site. And what makes these three similar is that these are all super sweet varieties. Mm -hmm. So we got some triple sweet and quad sweet. And if you watched our shows where we talked about those, those actually contain a combination of super sweet and the other corn genes. Mm -hmm. These here are just straight super sweet. So if you like your corn sweet, or the other advantage of the super sweets, they hold a lot longer. You got 10 days or maybe a little more from harvesting to when they're going to get starchy and no good. So longer harvest window, you ain't got to put them up right then. Um, they're going to hold a little better and they're going to be sweet and delicious. So we got a bicolor, a white, and a yellow. We got the passion, which is the yellow, the devotion, which is the white, and the obsession, which is the bicolor. The obsession is extremely popular. I've heard a lot of people that swear by these. Now, <clears throat> let me give everybody a little lesson right here. Just in case you go online doing some research on these varieties somewhere else than our website. If you see something that's called obsession to, or devotion to, or passion to, you'll know it by the price tag, but those are the GMO versions of these corn, these varieties right really? here. So yes, you can get these. In a seed pack? 
not in a seed pack. You probably have to buy them by the pound. Uh, but you can get these in a Roundup Ready variety, version. Uh, these are not GMO, non-GMO stuff right here on all our seeds. But if you see Obsession 2, it'll have a 2 behind it. Devotion 2 or Passion 2, there is a Roundup Ready version of it out there. Like I said, you would know, you won't accidentally buy it because the price tag on that kind of corn is extremely high. But just so you know out there and you know the difference between the non-GMO and the GMO stuff. Just trying to keep everybody educated. Good thing I didn't know that. Now these are what I will call mid-season corns. They're not early maturing and they're not late maturing, around 80 days to maturity from planting, which is pretty much in the middle there. Yeah, I'm gonna plant me one of these uh, next year. I hadn't grown any just regular yellow corn. Uh, I grew white, I grew the Avalon, which is white, the Temptress, which is bicolor. I got Primus, which is bicolor. I ain't grown any yellow corn in a long time. I'm due this for some yellow corn. Yep. Well, I ate me a big old belly full of it last night coming out of the freezer. Mm-hmm. All right. <clears throat> We're going to talk about peppers, are Peppers we? now. And, and it, well, I'm not even covering all the new stuff on the site. I just picked a few that I want to talk about. Let's start off, let's start off with some bell peppers here and these are all sweet peppers this is a variety of bell I've been wanting to get my hands on for a while called king arthur bell pepper it's supposed to make some big gigantic blocky bell peppers um if you, you like go the in stuff, the grocery store that would be one of the varieties you probably seen it in more great old big ones yeah if you like to stuff them you like them nice big ones that are easier to slice and that one has some disease resistance as well i believe Got this one here I'm really excited about. This is supposed to be the, one of the most productive and delicious yellow bales out there. This one's called Early Sensation. And uh, let them look good right they there. Do. Just eat them raw right there. Anyway, so Early Sensation, it, it starts off green, as all bales do, most of them do. And then it's going to turn yellow on you. Pretty good uh, maturity date on those uh, as far as early maturing. That's why they call it Early Sensation. Then we got this one here. I had a lot of people requesting this one uh, within the last year, this gypsy pepper here. This is a sweet pepper. It's supposed to be super, super productive. And once they mature, you get all these different shades or levels of maturity, of green to yellow to orange to red uh, on the plant there. These look a lot like what we used to call the lunchbox peppers. Mm -hmm. uh, Those make great for container gardening also or for patio gardening to grow in a one or two in a container on your porch or your balcony. Nice compact plant. Gypsy. Oh, I w we weren't supposed to say that word. Was oh, uh, we messed I had up. I forgot about that. That's the name of the pepper, though. That is, well, yeah. As long as we don't use it in a Shrank, derogatory right. slang form. I about forgot about that. This last one here I'm really excited about. And this one here is a habanero. And I personally, I can, I like hot stuff. I can eat habanero hot sauce, a little bit of it at a time, but I really like the flavor, the citrusy flavor of the habanero. I do too. A lot of people like yourself don't care much for the heat. I don't, but habanero to me has one of the best flavors of any of the peppers. So this one here is called roulette and this is a heatless habanero and uh, it's supposed to have some nice thick walls on it, real good citrusy flavor. It's going to mature to kind of a deep yep. red color and I think that one there is going to be a winner. See, I don't care for bell pepper. Really? I don't care for the flavor on bell pepper at all. You like those kind of gypsy peppers? Gypsy, the habanero, the poblanos, those are the ones I care for. Something about that bell just doesn't You should try that, that beaver dam pepper. It's got a yeah. really, really good flavor to it. Yep. Speaking of seeds, where are we at? I mean, we get people all the time ask, well, have you got the new seeds in yet? Or can I go ahead and order? We are in the middle probably over halfway of having pretty much all the seeds packed for this coming year, would you say? Mm, I'd say we're somewhere close to being halfway. Well, uh, we got some stragglers. We know it's gonna be another month or two. I say by January 1st, we're gonna be 85% there. What do you say? That's a bold prediction. Uh, I'll say by the time, I'll say by the time people in Florida which are ahead of us, get ready to plant. 
I should have everything in. See, the problem is a lot of these people get snowed in these long, cold, rainy days, and they want to get in there and go ahead and pre-plan, go ahead and order their seeds out there. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about that in one of our questions later. I don't want to give But, a, I mean, to give you an example, we have already got a lot of our seeds in, so if you want to go ahead and place an order, feel confident that if we got them in, you can go ahead and get them in their fresh seeds and their good seeds to Yeah, plant. yeah. Now, we are having some more stuff come in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're adding some new varieties, and it's going to be, some of these new varieties are going to be another couple of months at most on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing I was going to mention, it, if anybody out there, if you got any, uh, we try to mention this every few shows, if you got any show topics that you would like us to cover, definitely put those in the comments below. You can put more than one. You can make a list of potential show topics, but uh, give us some ideas of what you'd like us to see talk about on future shows. Yeah, before we get on to another subject here, elephant garlic, if you live here in the south or on up and probably zone, did you say zone seven or below? I, I, I planted it as late as early, mid-December before. you still got plant time to get this elephant garlic in. And it's a wonderful thing to grow in, you know, in the wintertime, we got plenty of room in your garden. One of the easiest things yeah. to grow. And it comes in, this is the one pound container that comes in here, and there's anywhere from, what? Eight to eight ten. Eight and twelve cloves in here. You break them apart just like that, and you want to plant that big old clove. And for you folks over in Alabama, you plant the root part there down, the pointy part there up, and uh, just cover it up with soil about right there. It's a great addition to the winter garden. You can grow them in a container, a yep. raised bed, in the yep. ground. Get some order. There's not a huge supply of them out there this year, but uh, it's a great, you know, you can roast these babies. They get to have around. They store pretty good, too. And once you get your good seed stock going, I saw I always <clears throat> mention this on my video coming out this weekend, but get a little more than you think you're going to eat, and you can get you a little seed stock going and kind of multiply yep. that every year. Yep. Uh, share with your friends or your neighbors if you got any. That's right. Garden cedar. You got an update on garden cedar. We're cedars. working on them. Building them right now. So we're building. We've been building them for a week. We're but working on them. So folks is going to be if they want one as a Christmas present. Well, let's hope so. I'm not making any promises, but let's hope so. You trying? We're we're doing our best. Uh, another thing out there, <clears throat> we have noticed that a lot of other companies are suggesting that their customers go ahead and purchase things for the holidays because they anticipate the shipping season to be an absolute nightmare. Um, I, I haven't heard anything locally. Uh, I don't know, have you talked to our UPS people? Have they suggested uh, that? Was they've good? already, I believe that they, and I've noticed in the last week they've staffed up a little bit. They seem like they're doing a lot better job this year staffing up some in anticipation of the big year. No, we can't now, that's not the post office does. That's not, no, the post office, I'll make no claims about the post office. But uh, it appears that they're stepping up. They know that there's going to be a huge increase in online orders this year. Yeah. Now, whether they're going to be able to handle it or not, yet to be seen. There ain't going to be a lot of people going out Black Friday shopping, standing in line, fighting in Walmart this I year. I can promise you the post office is going to be in trouble because they just ain't got enough foresight to know what's fixing to happen. They just that far behind. Don't get me started on the post office. The UPS has got enough sense to know what's fixing to happen. And they're trying to anticipate for it. They're trying their best. Post office they ain't even got a clue. And, and, and we foresee still being able to get orders out the same day during the holiday yeah, season. Yeah, get yeah. stuff shipped fast. Yep. Usually we can get stuff delivered to your door right up there to that, sometimes a few days before Christmas. Yep. Uh, so we should be in good shape there. All right, this week, <clears throat> that was a good time because I've noticed a little damage out on my garden. Now, obviously, you had something way more severe happen than yours, <clears throat> but I've noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, a little damage out in my garden that's caused me to make sure I got my spray program in check. And so what we want to talk about today is cool season pest control. Which is a little different than warm season pest control. We have different options we can use. <coughs> we have to treat them a little different because the pests are... Different pests, different options. We're not really dealing with squash bugs this time of year. Not really dealing with leaf-footed bugs like we get on our tomatoes and peppers. Um, <coughs> Aphids are normally not quite as bad, but that being said, they can flare up in no time. Not really dealing with pickle worms. So a lot of the things we deal with in the hotter months, 
warmer months we're not really dealing with now, but we get a kind of a whole new set yep. of pests this time of year. Those worms really eat on us this time of year. Worms. If if there's anything uh, I've learned from just following our row by row group, these during the cool season, people struggle with those worms eating on their broccoli, their cabbage, yeah. their collards. Yeah. And I they have can a few get holes. Out, they can get out of control in a hurry. They can. They can. Now, they, you have, in the summertime, you have what we call chewing wasps. We do have some of those, sometimes it will actually make holes into your plant where it's like it's being chewed upon. So it's not always 100% worms, but I'd say it's 95%. Those chewing wasps are not near as prevalent, especially this time of the year, is what they are. And sometimes we'll have a little bit of that but uh, the worms, if you see eating on your leaves, most of the time it's a worm issue. Yeah, there's several different kind of species that, that are bugaboos for people. Um, and, and these are all what we call Lepidopteran larvae. Lepidopteran is the class of butterflies and moths. And uh, so you got the diamondback moth caterpillar which is the worm that, you know, the larval form of that diamondback moth. The cabbage looper, which is a big one. You hear about the cabbage worm, and you also hear about cut worms. Yeah, and there's ways you can identify each one of these. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, I don't know that you need to. I mean, we get hung up on that sometimes in the horticultural industry. The, the treatment's the same. All right. of them with the exception of cut worms. Yeah, yeah. I, if I see a worm out there, i be honest with you, if I see worm damage, I'm really not going to pick it up and try to go see if it's a cabbage looper or a cabbage worm or whatever. I'm a, I'm going to spend my time coming after that tail. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then we got this is something we don't really deal with a lot, but some people do, uh, and that is slugs. Slugs like to come out this time of year. I don't need to bring any. We have a product called Sluggo Plus. It's actually made with spinosad, and you sprinkle it on the ground. It's a bait. It's a bait, and it'll knock them right out. Yep. We don't have a lot of issues with slugs. People up north have these more overcast days. They have a lot of high organic soils. They have more problem with it than in the south. The last one we got are flying slash crawling insects. Um, we mentioned aphids. Aphids can, can eat on those greens, tear them up. The ones I struggle with the most, and, and certain things they don't get, certain things they do. The one thing, man, they can just destroy and they love is like some Chinese cabbage. You plant that Chinese cabbage, which is, or even Napa cabbage, if you ain't careful, you come out there one day and all you'll see is just veins. They have eaten all the green off of it and they'll mm -hmm. just take them down in a heartbeat. So flea beetles have to watch out for. White flies can be tough. Yeah, they can be. Now, they mostly have cycled down. Their population is not near as, as high this time of year. They're starting on their downside. So we don't have as much problem now as we do back in September. September's horrible for white flies. Now, I ha we have a decent population of these around here. I don't really see them out in my garden, but they are troublesome for some people, and those are earwigs. Yeah, earwigs, they... Uh, I see more earwigs in the house than I do yeah, in the they garden. They eat organic, dead organic, and then regular plant, alive plant organic matter. They also feed off of... Uh, animals you know dead animals or whatever they can feed off pretty much anything and of all the things we talked about that's probably the easiest thing to identify yeah well, everybody knows what they are little pinchers they will pinch you yeah pincher pincher okay so we're going to talk about our individual programs and and there's not everybody always wants a one-size-fits-all solution and it's that's tough, tough. it's, it's tough because everybody's got different pressures we just named all these uh pests here I don't have a problem with every single one of those. And you may have a problem with different ones than I have. Sure. And so we have to understand which, <clears throat> which uh, program is going to work best uh, for each person. Before we get into our programs, let's just talk some general good pest control practices. Uh, I got a little list here, little bullet points. First one, if you had a problem last year, you can guarantee you know what to you, you're going to have a problem this year. Yep, and as Barney Fife used to say, nip it in the bud early. That's right. Nip it in the bud for you. So if you had a problem last year, go ahead and get your artillery ready, get your, your, your products ready, and be ready to take them on this year because I promise you they didn't go nowhere. Yep. Number three, you got to spray early, and you want to spray at least weekly. 
much. Things get real, real bad. You can go twice Pick it a week. Up a little bit, yeah. Some of these products that may have seven days on the label. I mean, and we go by label law. We always tell you to go back to the label. But I have been known to kick it up a little bit closer on animals if it gets really gets gets out of hand on me. That's right. So I like to spray almost as soon as I start transplanting, or if it's a direct seeded crop, as soon as I start seeing some true leaves, I'll hit them. Um, the next point of here, <clears throat> don't be afraid to make cocktails and rotate your products. Um, not all of these products can be, can have a resistance built to them, but some of them can. It's good to throw a wide array out there make you some cocktails, kill two birds with one stone. And you can mix your disease control that we sell together with the insect control and save yourself a little time there. Right. The other thing, the last, my last point here, if you do a good job controlling your pests this year, next year will be a lot better and you won't have to work as hard at it next year. Now at some point, you're always going to have a little bit of pest pressure, but if you, you, you be proactive and do a really good job of it this year, you won't have near the problem next year. And I, my buddy Jason at Cog Hill, me and him talked about this over and over. He used to just, his brassicas just get destroyed almost to the point where he didn't even want to grow anymore. And he started hammering down on them. And now it's just much more enjoyable gardening experience for him in the cool season. Yeah, and one of the major things you can do to help with your pest problem is keep a nice clean garden. When those plants start going back, still leaving a lot of dead organic matter out there for those insects to harbor in, Keep them clean, keep them cut in, keep them haired into your garden so that they're decomposing and you bust that pest control cycle. The last thing you want to do is have a nasty garden where they can just build up the generations out there. One thing that's not on my list here that I'll say, there are a few things that I don't ever have to spray. On my onion videos, a lot of people are asking, what do you spray on the onions? I don't ever spray my onions with anything. No, I, don't spray I did get some blight last year, but I don't even know if I sprayed them or not for blight. I don't have to spray my onions. Now, either. if I'm done spraying and I got a little left in my tank, instead of just spraying it in the yard, I may go over there and just, just finish out. But I, I don't ever spray uh, my onions. I never sprayed that rosella hibiscus I, I grew mm. this year. Another thing, I never spray my lettuce. Ever. Yeah, I never spray lettuce. Never spray lettuce or onions. Those are two things I can think about. I never, uh, carrots. Uh, I don't really see any reason to spray carrots. Beets I never really sprayed. Uh, there's certain things don't have issues with. Mainly brassicas that we're going to have issues with. Yeah, and it may be just point of where we live at. I don't know. Yeah, some I, people may have issues with pests on the onions. Yeah. I'm just kind of giving you what. That's the reason you got to, you got to take this program or take a program and you know make it work for you. All right, so I wrote down my program, you wrote down yours. Let me go through mine and then you can alter it for you. So let me get my products out here. So what I do is I have one set array of weapons, to make sure it's in the frame, for one week. And then I have another array of weapons the next week. Everybody can see that. So. And you, like I said, you can modify this just depending on what your pressure is. So what I'll do is uh, on the first week, or let's just say this week, I'm going to mix BT, I'm going to mix neem oil, and I'm going to mix this complete disease control. This is my fungicide. It's all natural fungicide. The BT is going to take care of my worms. The neem is going to help with some of them crawling slash flying insects. I like to use neem a, a lot this time of year. It mixes things up. I can't use it a lot in the spring and summer months because it gets so hot down here. Once it cools off, I forget what the threshold temperature is for this stuff. You uh, don't want to spray it above about 80, 85 degrees, I can tell you that. Right. So I, I use a lot of neem this time of year. I don't use it a lot during the late spring and summer just because it's too hot. So one week, BT, neem, what I call CDC or complete disease control. Mix all those together, no problems. Week two, I'll bring this over here. I'm going to change everything but the BT. I'm going to keep the BT there. Then I'm going to use hort oil to switch up from the neem oil a little bit. This hort oil really helps on those flea beetles. Get some nice good coverage on them plants. Kind of spray underneath the plants. Works really great. And then I'm gonna switch up my fungicide to some liquid cop every other week there. So this one week, this the following week. Now, 
one little switcheroo to this. If my worm pressure starts getting really, really, really bad, and it, sh it normally doesn't and it shouldn't if I follow my regimen really well, but let's just say you get two weeks of straight rain and you can't go out there and spray and your worms get out of hand on you, then I'm gonna replace that BT. With either of these combinations, I'm gonna replace it with some spinosad and go a little boom boom on them. But for the most part, I'm gonna lay off the spinosad. Now I got some corn I'm still spraying this with, but as soon as that corn's done, I'm not really spraying any spinosad unless my worm problem gets real bad. I'm going here one week and here the other week. Was that clear? That's clear. Okay. All right. That's what works in my garden, which is about 20 miles away from his garden. I'm and you're dropping stuff. stuff. I'm dropping stuff. You don't need any of these, do you? You brought yeah, your own. Yeah, but I actually picked up the wrong one. I'm going to have to. That's a long way down there. Hold on just a minute. Uh-oh. Okay. So we're going to have to do a little pretending because I picked up the wrong one. We have a product, and I'm just going to turn around where you can't see this area because I picked up two of the disease control. Let's see here. All right, let me do a liquid cup. Okay, so what I would normally do is we have a product called fruit tree spray, and I don't know why they call it fruit tree spray, but they do. But it is a combination product of neem oil and pyrethrin. Now, pyrethrin is extracted from a flower grown over there in Asia, and they extract that, and it's an organic from compound. chrysanthemum. It's a type of chrysanthemum, yes. It ain't necessarily the type we grow here, but it is one of the types. Right. They extract it from that, and it is a great knockdown organic pest control, but it also has neem in there. And any time, not any time, but a lot of times when you take these two compounds and put them together, you create what they call a cent Help me here. Centric? Centric? Synergistic? Yeah. Say that again. Synergistic. Synergistic effect. And what it does is most both those compounds work better. And that's what happens with this fruit tree spray. That neem also helps it stick a little better, I believe. And it also has disease properties to it, too. So it coats that leaf and protects it from getting particular leaf right. spores in there. So it has several different modes of action. It's a wonderful product. And when you mix those two together, it's great. The only thing I don't like about the product is they call it fruit tree spray. They should have called it something else because it works wonderful on vegetables. And that is one of my go-to products. I used that and this one week. And then the next week, I'm gonna need a BT. Liquid cup, BT, I'm gonna need you. Spin a set. I'm gonna need you to spin a set. Okay, and then the next week, because I have a lot of worm issues here, and I don't play around. Travis plays around with his worms. I'm gonna score and play with them and give them BT every week. I don't play. A lot of times I'll mix my BT and spin a set together, which you can do. It's not a problem. Throw me liquid cop in there. So spin I'll spin a set. When we mentioned it, not only kills worms, but does kill the it crawling does. and flying it insects too. It has too. a large spectrum of insects it controls. It's a great product. BT is only gonna work on worms. So you got BT that hits them as a feeder there. Your spin a set works as a stomach poison. Also, it can work as a contact. And then you got your liquid cop for some of your blights and some of your disease pressure. So I got boom and I got boom. Now let's talk about one more thing here. Let me have your horticulture oil. Horticulture oil is a great product, but it doesn't lend itself to as well to me in vegetable production. If your temperatures are low this time of year, this is a fine product. It works on aphids good, soft body insects. It works pretty good on thrips. If you was to have a, a kick up of thrips. I saw some thrips the other day. Yep. Uh, in my guard, on my college. This is a good product to use. But let me fill you in on a little secret here. You folks, are, and we got, we talk about fruit trees a lot. You take this fruit tree spray, and you take this horticulture oil and make you a mix together. That is a great combination to spray your fruit trees in the winter time with. And that gives you a lot of control on your, uh, if you have some warm days, we can have the scales hatch out in the crawler stage, that'll control them, but the horticulture oil will also control them when they have in the adult stage, when, when it covers over that insect and it'll suffocate them. We used to use this stuff a lot. It's a wonderful product to use on, on fruit trees this time of the year. Okay, so just to recap, your, your fruit tree addendum, you're recommending hort oil and fruit tree spray. Yep. Uh, and then 
for your vegetables, yep. you're going CDC, Complete Disease Control, plus fruit tree spray yep. one week, and yep. then you're going BT, Spinosat, and the liquid cop the, the next week. Okay. Yep. So as you can see, even though we're 20 miles apart, we each have our own program. There's not a one-size-fits-all program for everybody. Just use a program that's going to work for your particular pest pressure. If you don't have a lot of brassicas planted, then some of these products you may not need to use. So it depends on what you plant, yep. where you live, what your pest pressure is. There's not a one size fits all. If you do just, if you're just confused and can't figure out based on your pest pressure, what you should spray, highly recommend go to our row by row group on Facebook. Lots of knowledgeable people there. Post a picture of your damage. Just post a picture of your problem. And there's plenty of people there that would be glad to help. Yeah, and we have this nice, neat little graph on our product pages of our pest control products showing what to use for what situation. It's a great tool to use. All right, all right. So, if you have any other questions about pest control, cool season pest control, cool season pests, put those in the comments below and we'll try to answer them for you. We've got a few questions from last week's show. So we got six questions here. And I'll let you go ahead. Yep, first one's from LWP, and he wants to know, please keep us updated on the determinate cherry tomato you mentioned in the previous show. We'd like to know more about it. Thanks. LW, I like them initials. Mm. That's a lot better than my initials, LWP. LWP keeps you guessing that. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, we mentioned, this was late it. summer, or late summer, early fall, well, uh, we were looking at a couple of varieties we we're going to be adding, and the grower actually sent, which this rarely happens. He overnighted us with FedEx some samples. Some samples, and this one was a grape tomato, a determinate grape tomato, uh, which you don't really see most of your cherry your grapes are indeterminate. This is a de determinate grape tomato. It's about that big around, and it had the prettiest color on it you had ever seen. And it had what they call the crimson gene. And it's, it has nothing to do with GMO genetics or anything. This is just taking a tomato, a really dark red tomato, and, and hybridizing it with the, the grape variety. Anyway, so it's determinant, it's grape, and it has this crimson gene, and it was the best tasting cherry slash grape tomato hands down I hands have down. ever had. Um, so we have it, it's here. It's, it, I still, well, I gotta get seed packets printed. We'll have it on the site before anybody needs to plant any of them. Um, What's the name of it? It's called Mountain Vineyard. Ooh, that's pretty, isn't it? Mountain so, Vineyard. So it's a, it's a member of that mountain series. Uh, yeah, and I'm gonna tell y'all out there some, you're not gonna see this variety anywhere else pretty much now, maybe maybe one or two dealers out there that have it but this is pretty much going to be an exclusive and the reason being is these babies are expensive yeah we're going to be able to offer them to you so you can grow you some it's not going to be that bad for the home gardener we're probably going to end up going 10 to 15 seed for a seed pack we ain't really got it figured out yet they are pelleted which makes it you know makes it nice yeah so we're probably uh, it's going to be fewer seeds per pack because these are these are on the extreme end of uh, expensive seeds uh, for us to acquire, but we liked it so much and we want to be able to share it to you. And, and I haven't seen the plants live and in person, we just tried the fruits. Uh, but I would imagine, as with any other cherry, a great tomato variety, 10 or 15 plants is going to be a gracious oh, plenty. Yeah. I think for the average person, they can, they can grow them and, and give some plants away to some of the neighbors. I think two or three plants, it's going to be a lot for them. So when you, you have your seed tray, you can just, yeah. the last two rows there. I will tell you, all, not only did it, was it the prettiest tomato I've ever seen, but it was hands down the best tasting cherry tomato I've ever tasted. So be patient with us on that. and. Um, I would say give me a month, a month and a half, and uh, we'll try to have those on the website in time for you to start your seeds whenever you do that, late January, yeah. uh, February, whenever. All right, number two is from Laura McDonald. And she wants to know where you had the Roselle hibiscus seeds that you made tea out of. Yes, Laura, actually the seed suppliers on these seeds are pretty much in India. So a lot of these herbal seeds and I guess you would classify this as a herb, is grown in India. And we have some on the way as we speak, should have them here early next week. We're waiting on seed packs to come in. And that's another thing that we should have by the first year. 
Yeah, and the variety we're going to have is it's going to it's called Asian sour. That's sour for you that are well. That's just south. another name that some people call it. Asian sour leaf. Yep. Um, Roselle. Yep. Okay. And the next was from Ellen Brooks. She said, "What is stung up?" Stung up is one word. Stung up. Stung up. So I guess she's talking about, we were talking about my rattlesnake beans last week, how they weren't stung yep. up. Uh, down here, there's several things we can grow in the garden that will get stung up. Uh, comes to mind, field peas. I, I can't, I'm, I'm going to try again this year. I've grown field peas in about four years because they get stung up. Stung up. Pole beans. Basically late. In the spring, I had some half runners. Uh, I grew, uh, we got a few harvests on them, but they end up getting stung up. Stung up. Bush beans get stung up on you if you ain't careful. And lima beans can get stung up on you if you ain't careful. Now, yeah. most of the time, the culprit for us is a little bug, a little weevil actually called P. curculio. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got this long little uh, beak on it. Yep. Long little beak, and they just get on them peas or beans or whatever, and just suck the juice out of them, and uh, make them look quite unappealing, and um, yeah. that's usually what causes it down here. I'm sure there's other insects that can cause a stung up situation. I've never seen it on English peas. No, English peas don't get stung up. Yeah. Uh, it's just on field peas, butter beans, pole beans, bush beans. Butter beans not as bad. Not as bad, no. But they can uh, still get stung up. Stung up, yep. And that's one word, S-T-U-N-G-U-P. Yep. All right. Number four is from Larry T. Bowman. And he says he's gardening using earth boxes. What do you think about using our container kit for his earth boxes? He thinks it'll work. Heck yeah. I don't see why in the world it won't. A lot of people are using these earth boxes. We actually... You should know them boys a little bit back in the day, some of the guys that run that company, but yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Yeah. Idea for it. Yeah, you probably wouldn't. I don't know how, I don't remember how big, they make them in different sizes, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, just make sure you put, and with our kit, you can put the emitters wherever you want to, just make sure you put plenty, yeah. keep each box watered. Okay. All right, next one is from Jeremy Edgeworth. He said, would suggest ordering spring seeds now or waiting till fresh seeds have come in. I just don't want there to be a rush in the spring and miss out on some great seeds. Okay, so this is what we was alluding to earlier a little bit, Jeremy. So all our seeds in now are fresh. They have all been germ tested within the last nine months. And if any of them uh, go past that nine months threshold, we'll have them germ tested immediately. That's just the rules we have to apply, abide by here in the state of Georgia. So everything we got now is fresh and recently germ tested. The only caveat I would say, so so yes, you can go ahead and get your seeds now. Uh, I will make a prediction that we probably will run out of jambalaya okra sometime next year uh, from what I heard. So if, if you really want that one, get that one. The only, different, the only thing is, what will happen now is you'll go ahead and place your seed order and then we'll come out, we'll add that mountain vineyard or add some new ones there down the line and you'll say, man, I, I wish I would have had them. So I don't see us running out of anything uh, until maybe early summer or so. So what mm. I would do is I would make me a preliminary list. I like to map out your garden area. You're going to put a row of maters here, a row of this here, a row of this here. Kind of go ahead and map out your garden if you got that figured out. Go ahead and write down what crop you're going to put in each row or in each plot if you got several different plots. And then I would just kind of, kind of just do a rough sketch and I would, if, if there's stuff you really want to go ahead and get now, get it. But I leave room in your garden for some of these new things we're going to be adding in the next few months because I promise you there's going to be some varieties coming along. And we can't give them away right yet, but there's going to be some stuff coming along. You're going to be like, man, I wish I would have made room for that. Yeah. I agree with you, Trav, but one thing I want to add, I want to make a prediction too, of the seeds I think that we could possibly run short on, this goes by some of the past history. So we, you just mentioned the jambalaya okra. Now, if you think you want some jambalaya okra, go ahead and get it. I see tomato seeds, I see pepper seeds, I see bean seeds, 
possibly being a shortage on some varieties. I don't necessarily see it like corn seed being a, a, a we issue. We haven't had any issues. We, had any issues. we, we, we did have a little, little dry spell on being able to get some primus, but as uh, far as I know, that's resolved. So corn should be fine. Yeah, and your eggplants and your very unusual stuff, uh, eggplants, what else? Squash. I don't think it's going to be an issue with squash. I don't think tomatoes, peppers, peas, and beans. And, and that jambalaya okra is where I see if we could run short on some varieties, that's where I think it's going to be at. Yeah, I, I would agree there. I, I, I don't see any of our cucurbits. I haven't, I haven't heard any issues with cucurbits. Mostly, really, the, the things I've heard of uh, are beans and peas that are going to be short. Uh, and, and that's coming from the, the suppliers. Well, that's, yeah, that's just naturally. That, you, those two you just naturally know. Now, last year we ran out of several varieties of the tomatoes. Do we all know tomatoes is the most popular crop grown in the garden, so I anticipate that being the, another huge mover too. Right, yeah. But I, I haven't heard of anything else, any huge crop failures in any of the other crop categories. I do know beans and corn. Uh, are, are the two main ones where you'll see some variety. For instance, I should mention this. Just earlier today, I got an email from my guy who supplies us some Scarlet Emperor runner beans I showed on the show last week. He said there's a crop failure. Mm. So we're not going to have any Scarlet Emperor runner beans until fall 2021 at least. Man, I hate that. Now, I just had a lady the other day, and I told her we was going to have some. Now, if you've got some of those growing right now, and I had a guy on YouTube tell me this, if you've got some of those growing right now, let a couple of them dry out, save you some seeds so you can grow the next year. We'll have yeah. a new, within the next year or two, we'll have more. But if you got some growing right now, don't eat them all. And I'm probably going to save a few of mine because you said you wanted to grow them. So I'll save out a few seeds. Yeah, those seeds save well, and uh, you can save your own seed stock. I've done it several times. Those those save well and come back up. They hold the germ pretty good. You just put them in the freezer and yeah. you're good to go. Okie dokie. We well, got one more question, don't we? I about cut you off. This is from Susan Bergling. And um, she says, I'm seriously considering drip irrigation for my orchard. It is currently two rows of semi-dwarf apple, pear, peach, apricot, and plum. The rows are 20 feet apart and 90 feet long. Do you think she can use one system and just add more tubing? Or would you be better to have a system for each row? I think she should buy one kit and add to it. Now, Susan, one thing that you left out there that's a huge issue or, or we really important in making this decision. You don't tell us how many trees you're going to plant. So you got to keep in mind that with the orchard kit, you get 20 emitters. If you put 10 emitters per tree, that two, two, emitters. two emitters per tree, that would be for 10 trees. So you would need more emitters possibly. I know you would need more mainline tubing because the kit only comes with 100 foot. But I think you could probably buy just the kit and buy some add-ons with that being the tubing it's according to how many trees you got you may need more spaghetti tubing in the emitters you may not but i would buy one kit and add on to it's what i do in the situation or actually i mean if you think about it if you just got two of the fruit tree kits uh the only thing you end up extra is the extra filter regulator combo Correct. You could do two systems if you did it that way. You could, and you get a little bit of savings with that. So that might be the way to go. And, you have and all you have to do is move your water hose from one row to the next. Or you, or you set it up. Set it up and run one uh, combo, uh, pressure regulator got a combo, and you got a spare. So you, the, doing it the one way where it's all in one system is going to require a little extra setup time in the beginning, but then you just got one hookup to water the whole thing. The other thing to think about there is how much water you're going to need. You know, can't, you you know got I water. can't see that being an issue with no more than that. Of course, we don't know how many trees she's got. Right. But if she puts them 10 foot apart, that's 18 trees. So I can't see the water being an issue on that one. Right, right. So just, you There's know. There's several things you can do there. You can buy your kit and add to it or buy your two kits, whatever. And that's the great thing about these kits is they're so versatile. You can change the configuration on them so easy. So He's more one way to kill a rabbit. Yes, that they rabbit? are. That's right. All right, so uh, if you have any questions from the show, put those in the comments. We appreciate everybody always giving us their questions from week to week on the show. We hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Yep. If you did, give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. 
ring that little bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy tonight's show, check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.